Jay here for Stretford Paddock. This is the Tier 1 Podcast. Joining me as always is my co-host, Ronaldo Brown. How are we doing? I'm doing great. Do you know what I was going to mention when I came on here? I looked at that and I thought if you shifted a little bit more to the right, your head could replace the O in that Tier 1 Podcast what, behind like it. like that? <laughs> oh, not on the pod thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Oh, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. We changed it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it does actually. It fits in well there. Thanks for that insight yeah, as well. Um, that's the level of discussion you get on here, Simon, by this the way. This is great. No, I'm, I'm, that's the, that's the bar. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't get much better than that. Uh, also joining us is Simon Stone from the BBC. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Good to finally get you on here. No problem. We were chatting earlier, and I think last time you were chatting to Stephen Alson, weren't you? Yeah, I was, yeah. And I, I, I needed guidance as to where I was I was coming. But it's, it's always... It's always nice to come on. It's it's brilliant. You should do it yeah, more. like down here must look very very different from the last time he was on here though. Yeah, yeah. If you can remember. My memory go, doesn't go that go that far back. No, it, f- yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> 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 Were you here now? Yeah, almost into one. No, yeah. I mean it, it's it's fa- fabulous that you're growing from strength to strength. No, and, and uh, yeah, BB still, BBC still there. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Um, Loads of stories and stuff we're going to get through. We'll talk about the ownership later on. Me and you were talking about it on your podcast yesterday. Um, we'll start off a little bit about transfers, though. Um, obviously, the Mason Mount deal is done. There's talk of other transfers coming on. I'm just curious about the structure in United when it comes to transfers. What can you tell us about that? Is it the case of Ericsson Hart going, right, I want that player, and then the club go out and get it? Is there other people involved? Because I've heard that John Murtagh has a say. How's it work? Yeah, right. So, basically... Um, with any football club, they have a huge scouting operation, uh, data, they, they come up with a list of, of players for each position. And then the manager will also have his input, at a club like Man United anyway. And so what you saw basically in, in the January window was Ten Hag feeling he, he needed a couple of bodies in and he identified Sabitzer. He obviously knew Bayern Munich because he'd worked there. He clearly knew Veghorst through the Dutch connection. And that, I think he kept basically cherry-picked those players to come in. When you're doing it in the summer, it's not quite like that. I think you, you have input from various, various people. Clearly, Ten Hag will know which areas of the pitch he wants to strengthen. And we've known for quite some time that that was going to be midfield, a number nine and a goalkeeper. But the goalkeeper has obviously taken on more kind of focus now because we know that De Gea is not staying. And I think towards the end of the season um, and and certainly into uh, the summer, Ten Hag had, had basically decided he needed a new number one goalkeeper. So that's where we end up with Andre Nana. But then you have this weird situation now where Inter know really that they they need to sell him because they want the money to bring in Lukaku from Chelsea. United know they want to buy him. So it should be a case of saying, right, we want we'll give you thirty million, they want fifty, we'll shake hands on forty. But it's never as easy as that because it's football and player agents get involved and you have to come up with the right, the right package, basically, and the right package for everybody. So Inter Milan will want X amount of money and they will want it either in one lump sum or they'll want it as quickly as possible, basically. And Manchester United probably will not want to give it as quickly as possible. And and that is where the negotiation comes in. So at the moment, we've got this standoff where Inter Milan are saying, we want more money, and Manchester United are saying, we're not prepared to pay it. I'd be staggered if it doesn't happen. And I would be pretty surprised if it doesn't happen before United go off to, to the US because they need a goalkeeper, don't yeah, they? Yeah, hopefully, because... Because that's what I was, I was pretty much going to get onto and ask you if it was pretty much like a foregone conclusion. Because you're getting all these reports saying it's it's more or less imminent. But something that's rare, he's mentioned John Murta, but he, he seems to be a little bit more like playing hardball than United. Because United have this reputation now for being someone that kind of just pay up yeah. whenever they're asked. But it seems like we're being a little bit more meticulous in terms of not trying to overpay. Obviously, the budget is it, fairly stretched anyway. 
So I mean, it's it's difficult, isn't it? Because you you, you yeah. have you have a lot of different people that you're trying mm. to satisfy. If you you've got a budget, we all know Manchester United got a budget this year, basically because of FFP, the, the takeover situation, which we're going to talk about, could have a a bit of an impact there. But they are working to a budget, and they know the kind of players that they want they decided to go down the well they couldn't get Harry Kane out of Tottenham could they certainly early in the window so th this is why we've gone in, down this route um, with the goalkeeper situation but you you don't want to overpay and you don't want to um, be be almost taken for fools really by mm. uh, by the selling clubs and United have not been very good at, at buying and they've not been particularly good at selling <laughs> either have they and that, <laughs> apart from that we're really good at yeah, the first yeah, good, <laughs> yeah. they're good, good to read about <laughs> but the problem is then you also have a manager who's probably sat there thinking do you know what we're, we're back at pre-season I understand we don't want to overpay but I just want my player yeah. so mm. if it costs an extra few million I'd, I'd prefer to have my player in at the start of um, the transfer or start pre-season particularly yeah. and then we, I can work with the defence and that's where we ended up with last year if you remember with people like Ericsson coming in after the team had come back from um, Australia and it, it just it, you end up trying to kind of marry up these different parts of the club so on the one hand you want you know, in five years' time, you you don't want to be saying, well, United are also always getting held to ransom by clubs mm. and they always overpay. But at the same time, the manager's sat there going, can I have my players, please? I need a, I need a goalkeeper. Yeah, it's like like you say, last season, was it Casemiro came in oh, yeah. and Anthony? That's because, as Simon mentioned, it, it literally came out as um, people tried to remember the last time that United made a signing in the summer that was in June. Yeah. And I think it was Aaron Bissaka was the last player that United yeah. did sign in June. It seems like a general consensus that United always do it later in the window, July. Yeah, August. I mean, yeah. I, I feel sorry for them in a sense yeah. that, you know, City were linked with the guy from RB Leipzig. They've not got that deal over oh, yeah. the line yet. We're still waiting, actually, for Arsenal to sign Declan, Declan Rice. Rice. So, yeah. you know, these, these deals do take, just by their nature, they do take... A while but also agents they, they like to wait and especially if I was an agent now given what's happened in Saudi Arabia this summer mm. I'd be I'd mm. be just wait just wait see if something see if there's another offer and you, you know if you're not you're not doing your job properly if you're an agent if you're not at least throwing the fact that there might be some Saudi interest in if this deal doesn't get done at this time or so that's it's easy, it's easy to sit here and say they should get these done quick or they shouldn't overpay. But there's a lot of moving parts in, in transfers and I think that's, United sometimes, sometimes get stuck. But I think it's more to do with the impact of the players. And if you buy, I say this all the time, if you get the recruitment right, a lot of the other problems go away. Yeah. If you get your, if you get the right players at the right time, if you pay an extra few million, it doesn't really matter. In terms of the structure and the way deals are done, has it changed much under Eric Ten Hag from the way it was under? We'll say Ole Gunnar Solskjaer because I don't think anything was happening under Alvarez. Well, I think um, I think it's changed since Richard Arnold has become chief executive, because the the chain of command is still. Um, Recruitment department, uh, coaching department, manager, then the input of the football uh, director, so John Murta, then it goes up to the chief executive for a sign off, then it goes to the owners. But I don't think Richard Arnold is as heavily involved in the kind of recruitment process, shall we call it as Ed Woodward was, because Ed Woodward <laughs> liked to do deals. He liked to be involved in that side of the football club. And I think Richard Arnold very much 
likes to appoint people on the basis of what their strengths are and not look over their shoulder all the time. And I get the feeling that's what Ed Woodward was like. He wanted to be involved. And I think it's a more hands-off approach from Richard Arnold and he'll ask questions at, towards the end of deals rather than being involved in the in the sharp end of it because I think he views the manager and the coaching staff and the recruitment department and the football director as being the people who've got the expertise so why would he need to get involved in that? So it was a weird approach to football and it letting football people the make football, football <laughs> decisions well and it never would have happened on uh, Ed Woodward's watch <laughs> yeah I was pretty much thinking that's pretty much how it should be I wanted to go back to um obviously you mentioned the impending deal on Onana because I think we, we did get past it and he was slightly delayed in that being accelerated by the David De Gea situation being sorted and finalized but obviously we know now that he is leaving the club how do you kind of feel about the way the club kind of handled his departure I think it's difficult um, in an ideal world, uh, I think he'd have been able to say goodbye to the fans and that mm. meant knowing before the end of the season. Um, but even, even before the kind of latest, uh, well, it wasn't the withdrawal of an agreed contract, it was a kind of framework of a deal. And then, you know, it was moved, the goalpost go, go moved. But the head, the, the contract was not signed. Right, okay. It wasn't signed. The, the, the revised contract wasn't signed in time or, or a decision made, probably is a better way of looking at it, um, uh, to allow uh, De Gea to say goodbye to the fans, which is ideally what you would have wanted. They didn't know at the end of the season whether De Gea was going to stay or not. And I think that was partly him. I think he he had to think about because United had offered him less money than he was he was getting and I, I think anybody who uh, although we're talking about massive sums of money anybody who's asked to take a pay cut you have to think very very carefully before you sign up to that don't yeah, you of course. and what the implications of that are yeah. and you live to uh, means don't you so yeah, yeah so well yeah. so so I don't think it's all Manchester United's fault you kind of think that he deserved better than to have a deal there and then the deal get taken away. And mm. But it, it's not all Man United's fault. And, and I, I was very much of the view towards the end of the season that they, whatever budget they had, they should prioritise a number nine because you, you are mm. desperate for a striker. But when I saw Nana play in the Champions League final and it was the first time that I'd really analysed him properly. And I thought, he is so far advanced to De Gea in terms of his ability with the ball at his feet and the way that he distributes it, that it's just, it's just almost a no-brainer that you would want someone like that in because he will get you moving up the quick pitch quicker. He will get the ball out to the defence defenders quicker he will make sure that you're on the front foot more mm. than United have been and I've said this a few times one of the things that it, it's still a surprise to me virtually since Van Gaal left Manchester United Man United have been a counter-attacking team in terms of yeah. statistics yeah that's not Manchester United and I know we're, 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 we're advanced into an era of, of Pep and Pochettino's back now where clubs keep hold of the ball and, you know, Graham Potter when he's at Chelsea, like, you know, Arteta, they, they dominate the ball. And maybe towards the end of Alex Ferguson's time, there was a, an element of speedy players on the mm. counter, that's what United do. But they were always comfortable on the ball and they were always capable of of dominating opposition, either through through their passing ability or sheer kind of drive and determination to, to get in the opposition box. And I, I think until Manchester United get back to that, you're never going to get a club that's competing for the major, major trophies. 
And I think someone like Anana, even more than a number nine, will allow you to do that because he will be able to set up the attacks in, the in a way yeah. that you've not been able to do for a while. And you only have to look at Edison at City, Alisson at um, Liverpool to see what, what a, a modern mm. keeper should be capable of. And David De Gea, who I think is wrongly maligned because I think without David De Gea, some of the not so great seasons would have been far worse than they were. Um, I don't think you achieve that with David De Gea and you can with Anana. There may be risks. Well, there mm. will be risks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that might mean it goes wrong. Risk reward. But you have to, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, that is just the way it goes. Yeah, definitely. I, I get that point. And it was, you could see he was struggling, David De Gea at times with his distribution, especially on, under the way Eric Tanag was trying to yeah. play last season. Um, just on other departures, there's been reports that up to... 13 players may either be available for transfer or they're willing to listen to offers or if the right bid comes in, they'll, they'll sell him. Do you think we can expect a, a mass exodus at United this summer or do you think because of transfer uh, contract, sorry, it might be a bit difficult because a lot of these players are on a big money? Well, there's a couple of aspects there. First of all, you're right, they're on big money. I mean, secondly, you talk about 13 players. You're talking about 13 <laughs> first, first team squad players leaving. That... I, I mean, mm. th that would be almost unprecedented, yeah, really, yeah. in terms of, you know, how, y because most of these players you, you, you need replacements for. It's not as though you've got loads of players who um, are just kind of sitting around not doing anything. And this is where I, I talk about Harry Maguire. And the Maguire situation is, is interesting because I, I get the impression most fans would say, just get rid of him. Like he's no, yeah. he's no good. Is that the consensus on here, Ronnie? I'd say so, 100%. Right. I think okay. it's, I think it's time for him to go, basically. So that is a fair enough point. Yeah. And you could see also why he would want to go. There's Euros at the end of this season. Although we've had the Calvin Phillips situation, he's still managed to get picked by England. Would, would Maguire get picked by England if he wasn't playing? Probably. Well, maybe. I think Southgate likes them a little. Yeah, but there's a lot of matches to play, <laughs> yeah. but they're not Europa League matches mm. now, so every game's important. You also, where, where is um, Maguire? You could say he's back up to Varane. Varane gets injured quite a lot, so he might play a decent amount of games, but you could see a reason why he would want to leave. However, Man United paid a lot of money for him, so what are you getting back? And I've spoken about this, it, this amortisation. What's the player worth to your club? So are you going to get 40 million for him, which is probably about what he's worth in the accounts? So if not, are you going to take a hit on that? Then he's earning a lot of money because he came in as a, a leader that Manchester United didn't have, became captain almost immediately. I don't think anybody saw that as a bad decision. So he's on a lot of money. Who's going to match that? If they don't match it, well, is he going to leave to get, take a lower wage? We've spoken about, yeah. about with De Gea, why you might be reluctant to, to kind of take a hit on your wages. So if he's been forced out of the club, well, if I'm his agent, I'm saying, well, yeah, we'll look at leaving, but what are you going to do to pay pay his contract up yeah. or if he doesn't get what he's getting from another club and then also yeah, all these contracts have clauses in and they'll all have clauses for winning titles and winning trophies and winning making so many appearances and they're playing for England and all this kind of stuff so he probably his agent will probably be saying and it's not just his wages we're talking about it's all these bonuses that we're talking about here as well yeah. so this figure goes, starts to go up and up and up and up and up. And then, if you let him go, well, we've just spoken about the fact that he's like effectively back up to Varane. Well, you have to get someone else in to replace him. Yeah. And that costs money. Now, you might be able to get someone better, but the, the problem is, and I, I don't have an answer to this in terms of Harry Maguire, when you, when you add up, A, what you're losing in terms of the value of the player B the hit you're taking on the amount that you paid for him C 
the the extra money that you're going to have to pay him to go on his wages and his bonuses, and D, what you need to do to pay for another someone to come in and replace him, then you look at it and say, is it worth it? Well, you might decide, collectively, you might decide it is worth it. Yeah. But going back to your 13 players, are you going to reach that decision with 13 players? And that is where I would say it's it's unlikely. So you have people like Jaden Sancho, who, again, United paid a lot of money for him. I thought, actually, in pre-season last year, I saw him in Australia, I thought his link-up with Dalot looked really, really good. No, I agree. And that it was going to be a really good mm. season for him. And then his form collapsed after he didn't get picked for the England squad in September and he realised he wasn't going. And then he had that period out of the team where it, you know, he ends up going to train himself. Then, So what do you do? Do you think... Well, I, I, can, I can make something of him or do you reach a conclusion that, you know, he's going to be a bit part player. So we go back to the situation that we've got with Maguire and you've got Fred. You, you've got any number with of these Tomine. players. Yeah, yeah, I mean, these. Yeah, these yeah. So do you take hits on all these players to <laughs> get, get them out of the club? Or do you, do you say, well, actually... You know, there's maybe f three, four yeah. of them that we've got to go because we've got to replenish the squad. But some of the others, you just kind of have to kind of, kind of make do and mend. Really, I mean, you mentioned Wan Bissaka before. So, <clears throat> I think most people, again, we'll go back to January. I think a lot of people thought, well, he's not. Oh, you know, when the break for the World Cup was on, a lot. Of, People thought, well, Wan Bissaka will go in January, and there was there was interest in him, but he didn't go because right deal couldn't be done. And actually, I thought he finished the season quite well. However, is he really want what Ten Hag wants from his right fullback? Does he? It still doesn't look to me as though it's natural when he pushes right up. It still doesn't look fluid in in what he does. But maybe he's just one of those players that Ten Hag thinks, you know, he's, he's okay, he's improving, he's trying hard, he's not quite what I want, but I've only got so much money to spend yeah. and we, we've only, you know, our budget is this and we, can't, we can only afford to take hits on so many players. Maybe he's one that you stick with. Yeah, and with and with the Harry Maguire one as well, his wage would have definitely gone up with the Champions League yeah. qualification yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's like it does become difficult. You can't. Yeah. I mean, it's easy. It's easy to to just think get rid, get yeah. rid of A, get rid of B. He's rubbish. He's rubbish. Yeah. Get get rid of yeah. all these players. But actually, when you're the one who's signing off, what is actually happening? It, it's not quite as straightforward. Like you say as well, bringing in players isn't that easy, no, especially no, when you're Manchester United, because right. it's like, yeah. oh, United are interested in a player, the price goes up yeah, straight away. That's right. The player expects a certain wage because he's coming to Manchester United, yeah. he's heard what everyone else is on. The, so it can be difficult. The wages is a, is a huge factor as well, because there's, there's been uncertainty around Sancho's future or whatever. And then is he like a top five earner in the Premier League? He's, he's on a lot. I think he's, he's on, he's on, he's on he's, his big money. Because United so had two, two goals at getting him, if you remember. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, how d how do you convince the player to obviously agree terms with a with a, a club that's willing to buy him? That's not going to, be able to match that um, that wage packet, especially when usually the reason when players sign for United, they sign for him, and then whenever they don't obviously materialize or it doesn't work out for him, the only way is down. Yeah, well, and then it's like, how do you then convince this player to take the step well, down and the wage down? That's that's right. I mean. A There's point. a debate yeah. about whether the only way is down in terms of on the pitch, but, yeah, but yeah. absolutely, without question, and you can see this, the Premier League, the clubs in the Premier League, because of the TV deal, are now signing players that they would never have signed before. So, and I, I'm not specifically talking about Man United, who are a top-end club, along with a, a number of other top-end clubs, but the clubs that you would regard as top-end We've spoken about Inter Milan. They, ca if West Ham go for a player, Inter Milan can't match them. It's just, it's unbelievable. It's, really. it's because yeah, of yeah. the because of the 
the deals. Now it might be that the player says, "Do you know what? I don't want to play for, you know, West Ham. I want to play for um, Inter Milan. I want to play in the Champions League." But Paqueta came over from Lyon. Well, in the past, he would have he would have gone to a a Champions League club, maybe not in the Premier League, but somewhere in Spain. And I'm not talking about Barcelona or. Um, Real Madrid, but maybe he would have gone to Seville or way, maybe he would have gone to Atletico or Valencia or clubs like that, but they can't match the Premier League clubs now. So if that's what we're talking about in terms of, um, you know, competition for, for, for a wage, well, if someone like Jadon Sancho is available for transfer and he's on whatever he's on at Man United, realistically, how many clubs... How many clubs in Europe could afford to pay him what he's getting? And then how many clubs could afford to pay him what he's getting without shattering their own yeah, wage, structure, wage structure, which yeah. would immediately get every other player. Oh, we talk about Fred. Fred, Fulham are interested in Fred, have been interested in him. I'm pretty sure that Fred will be on more than anybody else at Fulham. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Well, if I'm at, if I have Mitrovic, for instance, at Fulham, and Fred signs, the absolute first thing I'm doing is going to see the chief executive and saying, "You see what you're paying him? Well, I want that." Yeah. Hundred percent. And that that has to be factored in yeah, as well. Yeah. Because yeah. if you're signing a player, if you're Fulham's chief executive, you're thinking, "Well, it'd be a good signing that. He'd, he'd do a lot for us." But we can't we can't pay him that because if we pay him that. It's not just him getting that amount of money. It's every other player that's coming in to my office saying, we want that as well. So how much does that cost you? And that is, again, we'll go back to the negotiations. That is all part of the negotiation. And that is why it's difficult to get deals done. It's difficult. So it sounds like United's wage structure is, is just a massive factor in what hampers us in our ability to sell players. Well, it's, it's, one, yeah. of the, it's one of them because... <clears throat> but, but this is why... You know, City have been quite quite cute in terms of like they sold yeah, Zinchenko. <laughs> Where was Jesus going? You know, Jesus yeah. in the same situation. Yeah. Well, if he was leaving City and City don't want him, where where is he going to go? Yeah. Who's going to pay him the money that he wants? Well, Arsenal are a big club, so maybe I mean that maybe that's why Chelsea and Mason Mount. Who is going to who is going to pay the players what they're getting when they're already at? earning a lot of money at one of the biggest clubs in the world. And United have been terrible at, at doing this. Because you mentioned all these players that we'd be trying to sell. We might have mentioned Martial, who was meant to be out, out of the door. Well, yeah, yeah it, like, it seems like Martial. Like, we have this conversation almost yeah. every year and every yeah, yeah, year. Yeah. It's like he has a good yeah. pre-season and then mm. um, he's, uh, you know... But he's United need a number nine, don't you? Yeah, because you can't rely on him, can you? Like, you saw that. I mean, Well, you can't, you can't rely on his fitness for a no, start. That's the I thing. Mean, I, think I, I like the player, but yeah, he's just, well, like you say... He's been, he's been at United for a long time to know for, for there still to be doubts about him. You surely... If there yeah. are doubts about him, then you think, well, he, he's not. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of doubts about this about the sales and us selling players and our budget. But I'm hoping we do at least get one person out the door for a fee where we can kind of fill the money elsewhere. I'm sure. I'm sure yeah. it'll happen. We, um, it was your 13, 13 players. That well, let's think. Yeah. It's up to, I don't expect. I don't expect thirteen <laughs> players to go out the door. By the way, can you imagine? I think, I think we are, we were speaking. Can you imagine we're, doing the deal and yeah. then somebody come right. That's one. We've yeah. got twelve Another to go. 12 to like, go. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> I think there was Chelsea halfway there. There was, there was been reports that yeah, that yeah, sounds well, like a yeah. top early summer. Uh, there was reports yeah. that there's up to thirteen players that are either up for sale, willing to listen to offers for, or if a big enough offer came in that would make the club think about selling yeah, yeah. but I don't expect it to be even half that much I think there's a, a long list of players that are going to go but like you were saying I mean there's just a few that you think like Dean Henderson for example looks like that would probably yeah. happen when a niner comes yeah. in but a lot of them it's just maybes it's like it's you know Donny van der Beek is someone going to take a chance well, on him yeah that's that's right but you then know. but then yeah, with, with van der Beek you end up in a situation where he's not protecting uh, an international place but he needs to play, doesn't he? Because he's hardly played. So what, what does he do? Does he does he sit for a year at Man United and have another year of not playing, or does he play and, and maybe maybe that makes it easier? Each each individual player 
has their own story and their own narrative. It's just that doing all these deals is not quite as easy. Should we talk about the dreaded T word? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I'm sorry, Sam. Good point, T. Yeah, hey, you, yeah, you wish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to do this to you. We've pushed it back long enough. enough. Um, but we we are gonna have to mention the takeover. I know you've you you probably you know you're probably keen to speak about it. Cause I don't think you've spoken about it, have you recently? I don't, I don't <laughs> think yeah. people but know. Yeah, yeah. Don't think what's going on? Yeah. So um, just just on transfers for starters, we can start on that because there seems to be different reports and different sort of suggestions. Does or is there still scope where a takeover could happen and that can affect this summer's transfer budget? Right. So what I was told uh, is. If if a takeover was complete and that took the large debt, because there's quite a few debts, yeah. but took the large debt off, the interest against that debt is part of the FFP submission. Right. So what you pay in the interest that comes off your FFP submission. Right, okay. So that would give you a bit of a bit of leeway, a bit of leeway. Right. But like the, the the interest on the debt, we we know that that over over like the servicing the debt is historically like we're up to like billions, aren't we? Yeah. Or, or a billion. Um, but in annual terms, it's not that much. And if you're talking about people earning quarter of a million pounds a year well sorry a week um it, it, it's not going to make that much difference but it makes some difference um structurally further forward then you, you might be able to do things in a, a certain way but in the here and now that is what is there and it, i don't think it makes it, it's not the difference between Veg horse coming in and hurricane, for instance. I, I don't think it it will quite fill that gap, but um, it, it it would make a bit of a difference. Yeah, because there's been a lot of talk, and they're like, we get these new owners in that we can go for. Well, the other thing as well, the other thing as well is if you're if if you're um, if you're negotiating a new contract or a contract with anyone, you might wait. You might be more inclined to wait, wait, wait see who the new owner is and then because there'll be a feeling that whoever the new owner is there'll be more money to invest in the whole structure of the club and that might mean there's more money for an individual player whether that's a renegotiated contract or a contract for a player who's you know that you're trying to sign so i think there's all <clears throat> all those l little things that that, that it, it does affect and I don't think anybody could say that the current uncertainty is a positive I don't think anybody in terms of player recruitment in terms of renegotiating contracts I don't mm. think anybody could say that I think the actual financial difference in the here and now it, it would make is minimal yeah, because that, cause that was the, the general thought process with the fans going into the window thinking, if we get this takeover situation settled early, there'd be this massive influx of money and we could spend players money on players here, there and everywhere. And that was obviously shot down saying it wouldn't really be the case. And even when the owner is finalised, if we do get a new owner and the takeover does eventually happen, we're starting to get doubts about that now. Yeah. Um, the suggestion that there's still like an eight to 12 week approval period yeah well anyway. but i mean it's the same as yeah. i mean it's the same as if you're buying a house if you if you agree a house well there's still a period of time but you don't just say right i agree it now i'm moving in mm. there's a period of time isn't there and you know usually you've got to get um like it's kind of like exclusivity it's called so you get to look at the books and do due diligence over mm. what what you're doing in the same way that you know, you'd have a survey done on a house to make sure that you're not buying it, and it's like the, the you know that it's about to fall down or something like that. You you have to be absolutely sure. Now, it might be that this has gone on so long that they don't need to offer exclusivity. But we're so far down the road now that you know I, I just I just couldn't be certain which way 
in terms of just getting it over the line, whether they say you don't, there's no exclusive, exclusivity, it's just been agreed, or um, there is a period of exclusivity. A period of exclusivity is, is that, and that means that it might be that the person who's given the exclusivity is given some um, some advance warning or some input even into decisions that are made by the football club, but ultimately until that exclusivity is over, the Glazers remain the owners of the football club. I'm getting worried now, aren't we, Jalen? We are, I'm getting worried, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was chatting to you on your podcast yesterday about this and... You know, a few months ago, I was pretty confident. How to buy a football club. How to buy Number a football 31. <laughs> Number 31. <laughs> we'll be into a third or fourth volume before this <laughs> yeah. is finished. That says it all. Number 31 oh. of a weekly show. And um, yeah, we're still <laughs> talking about it. It's still going on. Yeah, and it's like, when I, I came on there a few months ago, and I was asked the question about, you know, how confident are you that they're going to sell? I was pretty confident. I was like, yeah, I think that was back in January or whatever. I was like, yeah, you know, like little tiny doubt, but I'm pretty confident. Mm. Yesterday, I was like, I don't know, 60, no, 40, no. 60, 40, I'm like, I, I'm beginning to, to waver. What, what do you reckon, Simon? Do you think that, do you, do you feel that a sale is going to go ahead? Is that your feeling of it? Or do you think there is still a, a good chance that the Glazers might just be using this time to look at alternatives that don't involve selling the club? I wish I wish I could say I had an insight into the Glazers' thinking, but I, I don't, and I don't actually believe that anybody else does. There's been a lot of reporting and... Um, you know, it, it's in good faith. But I don't think the uh, the Glazers know. Well, the Glazers probably don't know, otherwise we'd have a decision. But it's the Glazers who are in charge. And I don't actually believe that the Glazers are, are, are telling anyone um, verbatim what is happening. And it might be that, you know, their communications with the Rain Group or someone, that, you know, you pick up bits of information. So I, I don't know. There's a... There's a two sides to it. You could say the longer it goes on, the less likely it is that it's going to happen just because if it was going to happen, it would have happened now. Equally, you could say the longer it goes on, the more the Glazers believe that they can hit the figure that they want because if they didn't believe that was possible, they would have called it off by now yeah. or we'd have had some clarification and we've had none of that um, it was told to me probably two months ten weeks ago that it was almost impossible to imagine that they'd go down the minority owner route which was bringing in some funding external funding for such like as the stadium or the training ground and and uh, and they would carry on. I was told that was unlikely and it would end between Sheikh Jassim and, and Ineos. But as time goes on, again, you think, well, you know, everybody's still at the table, so maybe that could happen. That obviously raises questions over what is going to happen to the stadium and how is that going to be financed and what happens in terms of the, the the changes to the the training ground and then what effect does that have on have on the the budget for for players going forward i i i have thought for well almost since the start of this process that the, the there was word after the world cup that the qatar uh, investment vehicle was interested in a Premier League club and I think they are invest interested in Premier League club clearly they have within their sites the biggest club that they can get they in a geopolitical sense there will be Qatari presence in the Premier League there'll be Qatari presence in a league that has Saudi and UAE backed ownership and there's a Gulf aspect on that there is a, a competitive element to Qatar and UAE and you're basically in the same city that is where 
the Qatari Sheikh Jassim bid is. If that is rejected, then Qatar's interest in the Premier League, I assume, will move somewhere else. So that could be a Tottenham. It's been spoken about before, got the location, got the stadium, got the training ground. It could be a West Ham. It could be anybody. But if you think that a Qatari ownership is going to arrive in the Premier League and you already have Saudi ownership and a club that's in the Champions League and you already have a UAE ownership and a club that's just won the treble, well, if you then add a Qatari ownership to that and you've also got Arsenal, you know, the other Super League clubs basically, Arsenal and Liverpool, um, who over the last two or three years have proved that they've been better at recruiting than United and they've challenged City, Liverpool in the previous seasons, Arsenal last season, and you've got Chelsea with their their model in terms of the investment vehicle um, that, that Todd Bowley's heading up and the recruitment that went on there. Well, if you're the Glazers, you've got to, you've got to challenge that. that. That could potentially cost you a lot of money at a time where you got to pay for a stadium, you got to pay for um, a training ground. Is that really, really what you want to get involved in? I don't know. Only, only them can answer. Only, only, only they can answer that. They were visual at the cup finals. Was that them reaffirming their commitment to the club, or was that them enjoying what could be their last days out? I, again, I don't have an answer. But I think whoever owns Manchester United, if there's a Qatari ownership of Man, of. of a Premier League club and it's not Manchester United that is going to be an expensive battle to fight to maintain a place in the top four let alone win things which clearly for Manchester United surely could even start stretching to the top six with the obviously you see the the ascension that Newcastle seem to be on as well so um, it is a little bit of of a concern with how United can actually eventually compete with yeah, that's a, these that, superpowers. Yeah, that's a worry as well. Like you say, I mean, if United don't have Qatari ownership, right? Fair enough. But then that could go to Spurs. Then, like you say, you've got another yeah another person to go up against. Yeah. And if it's not Qatar, then okay, you think it's going to be Sir Jim Ratcliffe? Has Sir Jim Ratcliffe got the money to well? To do I mean, that, we've, to fight we've, that we've spoken, you spoke about we've spoken yeah. about like earlier about recruitment and how difficult recruitment is. I I don't think. In 2023, there is any, there are any secrets really. I think the big clubs know who the best players are. It's whether you can get a decent proportion of them that will allow you to compete. There, there may be lots of reasons why you can't do that. I, I'm assuming that Mbappe will go to Real Madrid. Well, if he goes to Real Madrid and Haaland's at Man City, well, where are you going for a striker? And this goes back to the Harry Kane thing. So if, if, if you are Manchester United or any other club and, and you're, you're wanting to compete with the team that's got Haaland as their striker and the team that's got Mbappe as their striker and they've got decent squads, well, who are you bringing in as a striker? Because they're the best two. Kane, to me, is the greatest guarantee of goals that any yeah. Premier League club could have. Yeah. Well, if you don't get him either, well, where are you going? And then you might say that um, Ossiemen is a, a good striker, but he's coming to the Premier League. You don't know. You know, he's not. He's not done what Mbappe's done. He's not done what Haaland's done. He's not. You know, he's, he's had still one, kind of one un- elite yeah, season yeah. In, yeah. in Serie A, yeah. and. Serie A, like the clubs in Serie A are great historic clubs, but they don't like they don't win the Champions League year after year after year. They're not in the final. Was it unusual this Pretty year that Inter, yeah. Inter Milan got to the the final and AC Milan got to the 
quarterfinals or semi. It was, it was, yeah, unu semi it was unusual yeah. that there were so many Italian Napoli. clubs there. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Napoli went out yeah. earlier than you would have expected. So that's not to say that Osimhen is not capable of being a, a great player, because you know you would think that Lewandowski in his prime would have been a great you know, come from Bayern Munich. It, it doesn't mean to say that these players are not good players, but it means there's a risk. Whereas Harry Kane's like Kane's, a short I don't thing. see yeah. Kane as no, being I, a risk. I if Kane agree, doesn't yeah. score goals for Man United, that is a problem with Man United, not Harry Kane. No, I think he'd absolutely bang him. If, if you can play like that for Tottenham, then... Well, yeah, sure I, I mean, look, there's yeah. any number of reasons. Like, yeah. how many players have come to Man United and not, you know, Di Maria should have been a, a surefire surefire winner it, it didn't work out sometimes play, not every player works out but the point that I'm making about recruitment is if you're competing with all these clubs or seven or eight clubs and there's only four or five strikers well it comes down it, I mean, it, it comes down to money it's a competitive it's, world it, man it's competitive but Pe people sign for United because of Ferguson yeah, yeah. people sign for City because the of Pep mm. but if you take that out it, it, it comes down to money in the end and nobody's signing for Pep to play for 100 quid a week are they no that's true and is, is it is Daniel Levy really going to allow Kane to, to leave on a free next year rather than cashing on him this summer because he seems like he's playing hardball he doesn't want to sell him to a rival, it seems like. And it seems like he's, he's, seemed more, he's more open to the fact of selling him, but it would be abroad. So you've seen the links with Bayern, etc. But obviously there's money that they want to, that they obviously want to, they want to hit a target of, of a, basically a transfer fee that they're aiming for around 100 million, which yeah. I don't think Bayern will rise to. But is, do you think Kane later in the window could generally be a possibility if United don't kind of, get the Hoyland deal over the over the line or it'd we be, do get some sales in. I mean it'd be what <laughs> statement from a new owner that would yeah. be to get yeah. Harry Kane. Uh, yeah, you think yeah. I, I still kind of think realistically next year is better for United. Either way actually, because if he goes I, I would imagine I mean maybe a year it is too early, but I would imagine Kane's still got his sights on this Premier League record and maybe thinks if I have a couple of years year, a couple of years out of the Premier League, that's not gonna harm me too much I can still do it so you could think that he might go to Bayern and have a year or two years but like this time next year if United could try and could try and sign him that I could see that might work obviously if he's out of contract then United are pitching him but there'll be another a, a lot of other clubs yeah. pitching him for him as well um I, I, I get what you're saying and I I, I always see two two sides of, of points there's one side with Kane that you kind of think Levy is the businessman what, everything we know about him he won't allow Harry Kane to leave for nothing but equally he could think we had a terrible season last year the fans are on my back if I'm not, I've just brought in a new manager if I now, if I now say right I'm going to sell Harry Kane I'm immediately undermining my new manager, even though he said yesterday, you know, he'd not been given any guarantees, which is obviously fair enough. But also he gets more pressure on himself. He might think, I get, I'll have another six months uh, trying to persuade him to sign a new contract at, uh, um, at Tottenham and say that he can be like the club legend and, you know, he'll go down in history and that's worth far more. He might think that, knowing that Kane could sign for Bayern Munich as a, a pre-contract in January. Um, or he could think that I can get one more year out of him and if that year gets us into the Champions League or gets us restructured or gets us through this, this first year under Postacoglu, then, you know, that, that's worth more than whatever I, I bring in. So there's two sides to the argument, really. Yeah, I, I feel like with with United's chance to Kane, I just think it's gone now. I feel like it has. I just, Some maybe fans like still are say, holding it. Might be up. in yeah. a year, maybe there's a, it's a different scenario. New owner. I mean, it'd gone. be brilliant. For, yeah. I mean, you've got be a new owner coming in saying, there's there you Harry, go, Kane. Harry Kane. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, that'd be it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it'd be like everyone would be fully on board yeah. with that one. We need a new owner at first. first. Well, there is <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah, then maybe you the, need a new yeah. owner and then you need yeah. to negotiate. Yeah, then we need to. 
Yeah, just before we wrap up, Simon, I wanted to ask you about sort of this season. And you know, obviously, it looks like we're about to get a new goalkeeper. We've obviously got Mason Mount. Eric Tanaga, I thought, had a very good first season, finishing third, winning a trophy. If and there's lots of ifs and buts, we get a striker in. How do you think this season could go for Manchester United with his manager? Uh, so, I think that United have been where they are now three times since Ferguson finished. I thought they did it under Van Gaal, first season. They dropped down under Moyes. They got into the Champions League. Van Gaal wanted players. Didn't happen, they dropped out of the Champions League. Mourinho came in, obviously won a couple of trophies, mm. finished second, his greatest ever achievement. <laughs> Clearly that summer, <laughs> that, <laughs> that summer, he was like, banging on Ed Woodward's door, going, right, we, we need we need to push on. I want these players out, these players out, these players out. We want new players. Uh, and the club didn't back him, got rid of him. So they got up and dropped down again. Then Solskjaer, he, uh, I thought, was doing a decent job. They got up to second, probably his greatest managerial achievement as yeah. well. Mm. Um, and that he needed backing and they didn't get the right players in. Now, there's difference here. Ten Hag is not at the end of his career in the way that Van Gaal was. Mm. He's not abrasive in the way that Mourinho was. He's not going to kick off every single day and make life impossible. And he's got more kudos and a surety, I suppose, over his position than Solskjaer. So, for the fourth time, in my opinion, United have got to that position. They've got the best man that they could have to get them up to the next level. And I don't know whether the next level is winning a league title, because City are quite a long way in front. He's to at least close the gap. In in some well, what yeah. I would like to think of Manchester United is that at the end of next season, they can get there and really think, right, we're in a position to go now. And it might be, if you remember, there was that period with Liverpool where they built, they built, built a squad and then Klopp said, right, we need a centre-half, we need a goalkeeper. And they went out and got... Um, Van Dijk and uh, Alisson and that that got the, I mean actually they won the title they won the Champions League but they kept finishing second City and that must have been irritating but but they were challenging weren't they and I don't think anybody could dispute that I don't think Manchester United are challenging and I, I I would think that is realistic but you have to get your recruitment right and the recruitment is essential. So they need a goalkeeper. They need a striker. Are they going to get the striker that they want? I don't think they will get the finished article this summer. But if you get another player who can play up front, clearly better than Veghorst, someone who's going to be a goal threat, <laughs> then you might get yeah, into a situation yeah. next year when you're saying, right, what we need now is whatever it is, another a Harry Kane or a, a Declan Rice, or whatever it is, it's whatever the manager thinks. I think there will be a difference in the way that United play if Anana comes in. And then you might see a different United and you might see a different United to the one that I've seen you may have different views on on United I still think there's a bit of a limitation there but I think Anana has a potential to open some other doors for United and that could open the way up to challenging City at the moment I think if United can end next season and believe they can challenge City, that will be different. And that 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 do, that that doesn't mean that it's going to be you know they're going to finish higher than third. It doesn't mean that they're going to finish you know they're they're going to win a trophy. 
but it's the belief. So if you play Man City in the cup final next season, do you come away from that thinking, we, we really gave them a game? We really gave them a game and we were unlucky to lose. Because the, the United, United were a bit unlucky to lose in a way in the goals that they gave away. But did they really give City a game in the cup final? I'm not sure. I, I think if, that, if United could have won that game, but they, I think it would have been a set piece or penalties or something like that. I think you have to believe going again, going back to what I said much earlier. You have to believe we can we can get we can get the ball. We can keep the ball away from City. We can impose our game on them rather than make the best of their game. And I think that's what I would think is the aim for United this year. Yeah, just got to hope there isn't that. There's always that possibility of a sophomore slump. After a first sophomore season. slump, after yeah, get in the mood for America. Yeah, there, do you know what I mean? After hey, a first season, a sophomore but slump. I'm, I'm hopeful that if we do get in, we've got in Mount, get in a Nano, we get in a Hoyland, we get in maybe someone else. Yeah. I think United could make some strides, but I still feel like we're a little bit away. I, 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 think, yeah. I yeah. think it's the best position that they've been in, but they have been in these positions before. No, you're right. I mean, I've you know, we've sat here yeah. after Jose's first season, we've won a couple of trophies yeah. and into the Champions League and like you're saying, Van Gaal gets you in the Champions League and Oli, you know, gets you, mm. well, even when he got us third in his first season, then I was like, okay, can we yeah. kick on? And then you have the title challenge. Doesn't quite happen, but it's been great chatting to you. Anyway, so according to you, yeah, Onana's going to win us the title. We're getting Harry Kane. Yeah. And the takeover will be done this week. Uh, probably today. Probably today. And thirty <laughs> players are leaving as well. You said. Thir- no, you 30, said yeah, def- definitely. More. No, more. you're underplaying yeah, it. It's going to be six. <laughs> we'll go for um, <laughs> this week. This week. Thank you, sir. Uh, make sure you go and check out how to buy a football club. Yes, that's do. probably how gonna... to buy a football club. It's episode thirty-one. Thirty-one. Yeah, yes. loads. The best one's probably. Good. It's probably going to well, be thirty-one. What? Of 200, nah, or but, nah, but from what you just said, it's 31 off 31. Yeah, it's the last one, it's the yeah. last week. <laughs> if it happening tomorrow, no, because we'd have to do another one. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, go and check out the link in the description. Uh, Ronnie, where can people find you? Where can you can find also? me, um, Ronaldo Brown underscore 98 on the bird app. On the bird app, yeah, <laughs> we'll we're, we'll all be on pre season. Underscore well. 98 the year you were born. Yes, it don't, was. Don't, uh, don't, so honestly, mate, it's depressing. <laughs> it depresses me as well. I just pretend it's, oh. his, it's his IQ. Um, <laughs> 98, that's <laughs> good. Now if you double it. <laughs> you know I mean? <laughs> you didn't say eight. Yeah. Exactly. That would have been bad. That would have been <laughs> horrible. Um, go and check out How to Buy a Football Club. Go and check out Ronaldo. Don't forget as well, if you're not doing already, to subscribe to the channel. Make sure you're checking out all the other videos we've got. Simon, thanks again for coming on. Good no chatting problem. to you. Uh, Ronaldo, always a pleasure. This Cheers. has been the Tier 1 Podcast with Simon Stone, Ronaldo Brown and me, Jay Mai. Thanks for watching.